if anybody studied Freud, Freud talked about the ego. And the ego yeah. is really a very significant part of our psyche because the ego protects your self-worth. Whenever we receive evidence that doesn't validate what we think about ourselves, it causes dissonance. And that dissonance makes you make a decision. If I accept culpability, then I have to accept that there's something flawed in my approach. And it's more validating to the ego to blame you or others because if I accept culpability, that means that I'm flawed and I have to change. Welcome to Leadership. I'm your host, Aaron Keith Hawkins, keynote speaker, author, and today your gift giver. If you haven't yet received your free copy of my latest book, The Art of Trust and Influence, head on over to AaronKeithHawkins.com forward slash trust to grab your copy. It is your how-to manual for ethically improving your ability to earn trust and influence in your workplace and at home, I believe you'll find it massively valuable. That's AaronKeithHawkins.com forward slash trust. Now let's jump into today's episode. Dr. Anthony Bahamut, thank you so much for joining us here on Welcome to Leadership. I appreciate your time and the expertise that you're willing to share with us today. Uh, first and foremost, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. I'm great. I appreciate the invitation and I appreciate anyone who takes the time to listen to this and Hopefully they can feel enlightened when we're done. So I'm doing great. Just um, excited to be able to add something positive to this world. Uh, excellent. I definitely appreciate it. As I mentioned uh, before we hit the record button today, I'm, I'm excited to hear, to have this conversation with you as a parent. We have a 16-year-old daughter. The topic of education and especially leadership in education uh, is important for all of us. So to you parents out there, leaders, uh, especially the uh, educational leaders. Uh, I hope you get a lot of value from today. Uh, Dr. Anthony, one of the first questions I want to ask you is this, um, because uh, I'm sure you realize more than most when it comes to the topic of education and school systems, there are plenty of plenty of complaints, some well-founded uh, about you know their, their particular educational system mm -hmm. in wherever geographic area they live. But what are some of the, if you can give me some of your success stories, like uh, you're on a mission to uh, transform how, how education works in, in this country and in this world. If you could give us some, an example, some good news, mm -hmm. uh, something somewhere you've been able to intervene in, in either a specific success story about a, a student, a principal, a school district, a particular school. Uh, what's an example of, of how transformation and culture change in education can make a big difference and why it's so important okay. to have uh, people on you like that mission? That's a, that's a big question. So let me just kind of break it down into pieces. Um, sure. Just to give a little background on myself, I grew up in Flint, Michigan, and most people are familiar with Flint, unfortunately, in the modern context because of the uh, lead poisoning of five or six years mm -hmm. ago, which is still not fully resolved. But growing up in a factory town, uh, I grew up in a school system where it was very transactional. It was obedience ach achieved, a pat on the back from the system, lack of obedience got you uh, chastised by the system. But the mm -hmm. prevailing ideology was because Flint was a factory town, regardless of how you performed in school, you're going to work for General Motors anyway. You're going to have a good UAW mm -hmm. job. There was an industrial safety net. Well, as I was coming through school in the early 80s, that safety net was getting more and more porous. And many of my best friends uh, did not um, benefit from that safety net. And as I entered college, I started to see how a system that wasn't designed necessarily in the best interest of the student, I saw the collateral damage that it was having on my friends. So I entered the profession as a teacher, uh, as an activist. <clears throat> I saw if I, if I was courageous enough to intervene with young people at a young age, that I could influence the system and have direct access to them so that these young people would not have the same experience that my friends had. And I enjoyed mm -hmm. my time as a teacher. I enjoyed my time as an administrator. And what has led me to the work I'm doing now is that I realize that I could affect lives at a local level, a direct level, but if I would work on mm -hmm. a national and international stage, then I could influence uh, at, at, a, at, at scale. And sure. it's been quite a journey uh, the last 14 to 15 years as an author, a researcher, 
a thought leader um, to get people to realize that transformation starts internally. Uh, there's a yes. book that was written years ago by Robert Quinn called Deep Change. And his basic premise was, is that change starts from within. It's really re mm. it's reflection of who you are and what you value. So that's why my work has been specifically with schools around organizational culture. And organizational culture is really a microcosm of the macro culture. So if lack of appreciation for the poor exists on the outside of school, then it exists inside of school. Mm -hmm. If sexism exists outside of school, then sexism exists in. So my biggest challenge has been, uh, uh, Mr. Hawkins, trying to get schools to realize the error of their ways and that their thinking is flawed. And if you think in a discriminatory fashion, then your policies, practices, and structures will reflect that. So I take a very yes. uh, uh, intrinsically motivating approach to get people to confront what I call the brutal facts or opportunities to improve, to look at what can they change in their practice, their systems, their structures. So the, the greatest manifestation of that has been schools who have embraced what we call in the, in the education circles, the professional learning community model, which is a focus mm -hmm. on outcomes that I don't care whether you're male, female, black, white, Latino, tall, short, that we measure our success in the tangible evidence of the outcomes. And that seems to be somewhat fleeting in education because we've mm -hmm. never really been an outcomes based profession. Business is pretty logical. Did we sure. make a profit or didn't we? We've been fine yeah. in education by saying we've given students the opportunity to learn, but their actual tangible benefit of learning is really up to them. We've held, we've held a, kind of held ourselves harmless. And what's sad is the public mm -hmm. has really backed this, this narrative. These kids are so bad nowadays. When I was in school, oh, the teachers, um, you know, I couldn't do it if I was them. We've almost looked yeah. at our profession like charity. You give the kids sure. the opportunity, and if they care, if they engage, if they have enough support, then, th then they deserve the benefit of success. If they don't, it's almost like we feel they deserve the punishment or the mm. sanctions associated with that. And we keep forgetting mm -hmm. we're talking about children. So my biggest struggle yeah. is to get educators to realize that their success is based upon the actual tangible evidence of student success. I can't be a good teacher if I don't have evidence that you have actually taken away the tangible benefit of being the subject of my instruction. I can't be a great mm -hmm. principal if I don't have evidence that teachers are getting better. And as a result of teaching, teachers getting better, then schools get better. I can't be a good superintendent if the schools that I'm serving aren't growing and evolving. And this is a big one. State governments can't consider themselves successful if there's not evidence mm. that schools are getting better because of their leadership and because of their service. So yeah. we almost have to do a total cleanse of the historical model of looking at schooling and the actual impact on students and society, our model has been just totally wrong. So mm -hmm. the schools that realize that and are able to go through that journey, they have record impact or increase in impact on kids. Yeah. I'll even give you, your, your viewers a website. And the website is www.allthingsplc.info. And on that site, we have almost almost 500 model schools who've gone through this deep mm. reculturing, this deep dive, and there's evidence of significant impact positively on student achievement because the adults decided to do, be different. Not yeah. some yeah. new policy on woke or lack of woke, whatever the heck their intention is behind that. It's not a new funding initiative. We've tried to take mm -hmm. a very artificial approach to improving schools when really mm -hmm. schools are just a microcosm of the many flawed systems we have in our society. 
I, I'm glad you, you, you kind of jumped to something I, I wanted to touch on during our conversation, and, and that's your that's your, your model PLC schools. But, but before we jump to that, I, I would love to, for those listening, you know, parents, leaders, educators, what does it look like on, on the most bread and butter, write it on a napkin level? What does it look like in terms of, in, in your mind, when you approach a, a school district or, or a school itself, what does a best case scenario look okay. like? starting from uh, intervention, either your direct inter- intervention from your organization, your company, or, 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 or someone who's on a similar mission. What's it look like when a school uh, system that is broken in many ways uh, for the many reasons you described, what's it look like when there's good intervention and you start getting good outcomes? It's not as us? complex as it seems. It's the complexity of human difficulty with change and self-reflection and metacognition. Mm-hmm. A school shifts from stagnation or regression to progress when it becomes student-centered as opposed to adult-centered. So Mm. when I focus my practice, my behavior, our systems, our resources around the needs of the student, what can we do to enhance the experience of the student? So if Aaron is struggling with background vocabulary, That doesn't mean that Aaron is flawed. It means he has a need that we have the talent, the resources, and the ability to respond to. Often where they respond in toxic school cultures is they lament over what you don't have. And they are perturbed with the the discomfort that meeting your needs have. But what we know is every student has a set of assets and every student has a set of deficits. What's been Mm -hmm. prevalent is that the deficits that students of middle to upper middle class who come from nuclear homes, who are of a Western European ideology and and set of behavior standards, we accept their flaws as normal. But students of color, Mm -hmm. students of poverty, students of disabilities, For some reason, we frame their challenges as insurmountable obstacles or an inconvenience as opposed to a challenge that needs to be addressed. Every Mm -hmm. student has gifts. Every student has deficits. But the stain of social ills and, 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 and discrimination make it seem as if some students are just somehow irredeemable. And they're not. What what is a what does a good intervention look like? You know, I, I I we I'm sure we've all and myself included have had struggles uh, during those school years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I often lament the fact that you know if I could, I wish I could have a conversation with my you know 12, 13, 14 year old self mm-hmm. because as you mentioned earlier, uh, we're dealing with children. Mm-hmm. So to expect them to have the same level of cognition and re- and reflection mm-hmm. capable of a 20, 30, 40, mm-hmm. 50 year old adult. It's just not fair um, for all of us uh, who are adults and listening to this. You you know, we all have, I'm sure, things that we've done as children that we regret. And we talk about what happened in high school or middle school or something we did that we're not proud Mm -hmm. of. Uh, But we also don't we often don't look at it or discuss it through the lens of we were just children and we didn't know any better. We didn't have the 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 benefit Mm -hmm. of of, you know, life experience. Mm-hmm. So what is a what is a successful intervention on a most micro scale, you know, using a hypothetical or, or real case uh, scenario of a student who had a challenge, uh, there was a positive intervention as opposed to writing them yeah. off uh, because of who they were, where they were from, what they look like. What's a good intervention look like in the, in the simplest way? Well, form? it's all conditional and um, based upon, it's contextual. But I, I write sure. in, my, in, my, in my research about the tipping point between a healthy and a toxic culture. All students Mm -hmm. have challenges, and this is the tipping point. A healthy culture becomes what I call in my my, my literature, reflective and prescriptive. This is their ideology. What's causing Aaron's struggle, and what can we do collectively to do something about it? A toxic Mm -hmm. culture becomes descriptive and deflective. They're flabbergasted Mm -hmm. by Aaron's deficiencies, and they describe them to make them feel, feel better, and they deflect responsibility on others. So the challenge itself doesn't change. It's the 
response collectively of the culture on how to respond. So if your issue, as I mentioned earlier, was background vocabulary, if you're reflective and prescriptive, you ask, to what degree is his background vocabulary deficient? And what resources and structures could we use and practices to fill in that gap? Mm -hmm. In a toxic culture, they're flabbergasted at the fact that you even have vocabulary deficiencies, and they seek to make themselves feel yeah. better by blaming parents, by blaming the previous grade level. So mm -hmm. a toxic culture seeks to, to validate or make themselves feel better about challenges. Healthy cultures, because your success is that important, they want to understand it and work together to resolve it. Yeah. So the, the intervention yeah. is whatever the result is of that process, whether it's behavior, mm -hmm. academics, whether it's socialization. It's accepting you how, as yeah. you are to help you ascend to where we'd like to see you go. It's not that, cha it's yeah. not that difficult, Aaron. It's really what yeah. a good parent would do for their child. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that, that is yeah. a, and I, I apologize for interjecting here. That is, that is such a powerful uh, leadership and life lesson, you know, because it's, it really boils down to accountability, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the context of what we're discussing here in a school mm -hmm. system, it's, you know, there was a challenge. There was someone who was under our, our care, mm -hmm. essentially a, a student who has a challenge and rather than reflect or blame, as you said, a parent, mm -hmm student, their neighborhood, whatever excuse you might put in, then basically, basically what it is is saying, it's not my problem to fix. Mm -hmm. Too bad. We have other things to worry about. It's what do we have that can help? Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that is, it, it's, it, if I'm hearing you correctly, it, it sounds like just, it's accountability. Yeah. Really. And it's, it, this yeah. is our challenge. This is ours to solve. Absolutely. And we, and, and most importantly, having that presumption that we can solve mm -hmm. this. Like you said, it's not that difficult. We're not trying to put, you know, a rocket ship on another mm -hmm. planet. We're trying to help a student who's right in front yes. of us overcome this challenge times. However, many students are in that school or district, it's just, a, it's a repeatable yeah. pattern. And what you describe is um, what John Hattie, who's a very prominent educational researcher would call collective teacher efficacy, the belief mm -hmm. in our yeah. ability to resolve an issue and some of the defensiveness yeah. There's actually a deeper root to it. If we, if anybody studied Freud, Freud talked about the ego. And the ego yeah. is really a very significant part of our psyche because the ego protects your self-worth. Whenever we receive evidence that doesn't validate what we think about ourselves, it causes dissonance. And that dissonance makes you make a decision. If I accept culpability, then I have to accept that there's something flawed in my approach. And it's more yeah. validating to the ego to blame you or others, because if I accept culpability, that means that I'm flawed and I have to change. Mm, imagine that. Right? So it becomes a lot easier to make <laughs> yeah. others culpable as a way to protect one's ego or one's self-worth. And it's very yeah. prevalent in the culture of education. Uh, doctor, what may I ask is... Um, and you're, oh gosh, how many years have you been, been doing this? A couple 33 of decades, years. if I'm not mistaken. 33, yeah. What is one of the, and this may be a difficult question to answer, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> what do you see as, a, as a, a common challenge that you see in a school system, meaning a common issue um, that perhaps is one of those things where you as the professional say, okay, we, we see this a lot. Uh, what is a common challenge you see in school systems? And perhaps more importantly, what is a, one of the common threads when you see those common challenges that overcomes the hurdle to a school system having a culture issue that needs to change and making that shift into we are now going to take some action mm -hmm. to change this culture? Where is that, uh, to use a term you mentioned earlier, where, is that, where do you see that tipping point coming a lot? For, for people out there to give them a good idea how this can yeah. evolve for them and their children. We found that it, 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 it is almost without exception the example and the priority set by leadership hmm. that school cultures don't typically evolve on their own. It requires a catalyst. 
Because if people don't get a chance to step back and reflect and see where they need to improve, then why would I need to improve if I don't think that anything's flawed in my behavior? So leadership becomes absolutely essential. And leadership in the modern context uh, is, is addressing something that many of us call the compliance mentality. Uh, no child left mm-hmm. behind will go down is one of the worst public policy decisions in American history. It made school districts believe that success is measured totally on one standardized test in two areas, math and reading, that's culturally biased and given annually, and you compare our proficiency rates to to our neighbors. So what we found over Mm -hmm. the past 20 plus years since No Child Left Behind was made law in 2002 is that if a system gets good enough test scores comparatively to their neighbors, they think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. If a school doesn't, they think they're hopeless. So the schools Mm -hmm. on the upper band don't see a need to change because from all their indications, they feel validated. We're a good school. The schools that are vilified or, or, or embarrassed in the newspaper and called failing and, and priority schools, they think that they're hopeless and nothing could be further from the truth. So mm. a leader who's able to break through that, and we've seen more of this the last eight to 10 years, a leader who realizes that they're chasing the wrong, they have the wrong drivers and they're chasing the mm. wrong end. Every school in Florida needs to improve. They just need to improve on something different. So the schools in the wealthy communities, you're no better than anybody else. The test that the state of Florida gives is calibrated to the experience of your students. They would have done fine on that exam no matter what you do. People Mm -hmm. in cities like Liberty City, Miami, the poor parts of Florida, you are no more flawed than anybody else. The test just doesn't measure your students' built-in proficiencies. It highlights their deficiencies, why it highlights the proficiencies of other districts. When leadership realizes that they can't be defined by some invalid state test, and it is really about improving the lives of young people, and how do we pragmatically drive our own bus? Where are our students strong? Where do they need support? And how do we help support them to become the students we expect? When they can see past that social, political, and uh, some of the, 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 the glass ceilings that have been placed among them, then they're free. It's kind of yeah. like you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, when they told Neo yeah, to free his mind. The current yeah. system of testing and comparing schools is the matrix that most schools are caught in. It drives their decisions. Mm-hmm. It drives how they use their resources. It drives staffing. When a school frees themselves of that and they get back to the root of the morality of our profession is to help prepare young people to be gainfully employed or productive citizens to make our society a better place, then they're not confined by the very toxic and and constricting uh, uh, environment that this testing, no child left behind testing has done to our schools and it's killing us. And when I work in South Korea, when I work in Singapore, when I work in Finland, even when I work in Canada, their systems are much more liberating and, and they actually perform much better on international assessments because they get a chance to work on the whole child. But just to be honest with you, just to be, it's, it's just a microcosm of every other system of discrimination. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, that is the reality uh, in, in so many different contexts, uh, this being education that we're discussing here. Um, and I can, that gosh, yeah, we can go down the rabbit hole of, mm-hmm. of how uh, systems become flawed uh, in, in many different contexts. What do you say to, you know, uh, we're having lunch with one person who's a principal, another who's a maybe a teacher at another school, someone else at the table with us who's a, a parent. 
how do we start this conversation keeping in mind the the reality uh, or i should say the the systemic pressure mm -hmm. for so many reasons be it financial funding mm -hmm. things that are that are kind of locked in place and are in many ways dependent on these standardized testing scores and, and these other systems that are in place that are flawed mm -hmm but that do have tangible outcomes, so to speak. How do we have that conversation? How do we start that conversation to say, we can do something, even with these structures mm -hmm. that in place, we can break through this mm -hmm. wall. How, what does that conversation sound like to, to, to decide we're gonna make that breakthrough without jeopardizing uh, or feeling like we're jeopardizing um, some things that could have some unintended detrimental effects? Well, how, do, how do we get through that wall? Well, number one, what we've been doing the last 20 plus years in the name of raising test scores hasn't raised test scores. Mm. So what you're doing anyway sure. is not yeah. working. <laughs> yeah. So why are you yeah. tethered to a system and you have all this yeah. anxiety and the achievement gap mm -hmm. hasn't closed one bit? So what you're doing is not working anyway. You might as well work on your con work through your conscience and your morality. Mm. And what we yeah. found is schools that don't focus on test scores and focus on student growth actually improve test scores. Yeah. When you stop focusing yeah. on test scores, you raise test scores because you That's a beautiful statement. Uh, I'm going to ask doctor, I'm going to ask you to say that one again, because that's somebody may have been sipping their coffee or something and maybe they may have missed that. Please, could you re restate that again about well, our uh, traditional uh, approach uh, hasn't scores. worked anyway. So when you focus on test yeah. scores, we never raise test scores. When you focus on mm -hmm. the child, and that becomes your fixation, one of the beneficial byproducts is that we'll see a growth in test scores. I'm not opposed mm -hmm. to proficient test scores. It's just not a good driver of organizational yeah. behavior. It's one indicator of many indicators. So when that becomes yeah. your fixation, you become tethered and fearful of something you're not making a positive impact on anyway. Yeah, wow, that's powerful. Um, that is extremely powerful. Uh, I, I, I couldn't have imagined a better answer than the one you just gave. Um, because it does, like you said, when we first started this conversation, it's not overly complicated mm -hmm. because I can imagine people that may be listening to your conversation and talking about the reality of, of the situation that we're in educationally and having that instinctive fear about changing something and almost bracing themselves against their desk mm -hmm. that they don't want to upset the boat because even if things aren't so bad now they're scared of making it or things aren't that going that well now they're scared it may be scared of making it worse mm -hmm. um but what i want to highlight what you're saying is if you ch if 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 we change our focus from this uh almost you know, bending the knee to testing mm -hmm. scores and these traditional things that we've been told are what we have to do for so long and just start focusing on these students and, and this, this humanity, this conscious, this focus on the student as opposed to the adults mm -hmm. that are in charge of these students, you're going to get the results you want anyway. anyway. And you focus on students. And you're yeah. going to do it with, yeah. you're going to do it with ethics, with morality, yeah. with humanity, and, and with, you know, children, uh, presumably that will go through life with some appreciation that people were actually looking mm -hmm. out for them as opposed to themselves. And at, at my school, when I was a principal in the, in the Metro Detroit area, we had a, a five critical areas of impact we wanted to address with kids. Academic skill development, we're very serious about that. You need literacy, numeracy, critical thinking skills, expository writing, uh, the ability to do research and to cite your evidence. I mean, all those things are critical. Character development. The application of what you've learned. We had a whole component helping our kids take the theory of learning and apply it. We had a, an entrepreneur program. Our students mm -hmm. every year took a social issue and wrote policy on it. Things like human trafficking and uh, being in a food desert, diabetes, and other community health issues. We had a focus on parent school community relationships. How do we educate our parents, our community? To work as one and we had a, our fifth focus was on post-secondary opportunities getting our kids access to universities trade school military uh, community college because in this new economy 
if they couldn't take what they've learned and extend their learning outside of high school, the data is really clear, your opportunities are limited. So we figured if we focus on those five critical areas, they pass whatever tests they were given. And we set measurable goals and objectives. We did reviews every quarter to measure our progress towards those objectives. Hopefully you'll see, you'll see that leadership makes the difference. My teachers were willing to do it if they were led, but they can't do what they can't envision. So one of the greatest obligations of leadership is to provide a vision for the organization greater than where you are right now. And if all I can tell you is, here's a, a curricular scheme I purchased to hopefully raise test scores, I seem like a sycophant and at best a middle manager. I'm like mm -hmm. a manager at Burger King. I'm just following yeah. corporate policy. Yeah. That doesn't inspire yeah. teachers. Mm -mm. Wow. That is a, 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 it's excellent communication for everyone listening. If you want to, and I'm sure you do, you want to learn more about uh, Dr. Anthony's uh, work and what he and his organization are up to and those reasons and those um, at all things PLC info that discuss some model schools uh, that have implemented uh what the doctor here is, is speaking about. I'll make sure to, to link all of those in the show notes um, after we conclude today. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that because uh, you there's probably people listening that are that are hungry to go a little deeper than this and certainly uh, deeper than what we'll be able to get to today. I want to I want to jump real quickly into something um, that popped into my head just because <clears throat> you mentioned that the teachers uh, on your on your on your website at um, I saw a link to that discussed wellness mm -hmm. um uh wellness solutions for educators mm -hmm. if we can touch briefly on that because certainly being an educator in whatever position you are whether you're at you know the pre-k level all the way up to being a principal uh, there's a there's a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. involved in education obviously mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest understatement i could make uh, where are you seeing wellness coming into play um and how it affects our teachers and, and what are a couple ways that educators can make sure they're taking care of mm -hmm. themselves because if we're not taking care of ourselves, obviously we're not going to be able to give our best to those Absolutely. who uh, we're in a position to care for. Could you, could you touch on that briefly about the whole topic yes. of wellness? The same way I'm passionate about um, taking a look at the needs of the whole child. It's also important to take a look at the needs of the whole educator and the whole professional. We're physical, we're hormonal, we're intellectual, we're social. The human being is a very complex being. And to not take care of your whole self makes you less equipped to meet the needs of students. So professionally, we found, and, and the research is really clear on this, that when teachers work in a collaborative culture, where it's not my students, they're our students. When teachers get time to collaborate, time to learn and grow, time to share, they, there are systems built to perpetuate their collaboration. The root word of collaborate is labor. It's co-labor. And schools were yeah. actually designed as individual stations of labor, they're called classrooms. But the schools where educators tend to be more satisfied is where there's more collaboration where it's a we mentality as opposed to me. We have this weight to carry, but it's a lot easier if we're all carrying it together. Number two, yeah. when it comes to wellness of educators, is creating a work-life balance. Um, if you're collaborative at work and you're giving it your all as a unit, then you can't neglect this whole kind of stand and deliver, freedom writers, that old narrative of the teacher who gives up his or her life to save a few kids, that's not an attractive, duplicable model. You look at all those yeah. films, they, they save a few, but they destroyed themselves in the process. Uh, that's not the goal. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's altruistic. And who wants to do that? Yeah. Um, you shouldn't have to fight City Hall, get a divorce, uh, keep the same kids for four years, tour the Holocaust Museum to teach kids how to write. I mean, we've been teaching yeah. people to write since human beings have been on, on two legs. 
So yeah, the whole idea of the altruistic sacrifice for my students, that narrative has to die. You have to take care of yourself personally, socially, emotionally, and leaders have an obligation to produce a collaborative environment at work so you don't feel like you have to do it by yourself. We can do this without destroying our own personal lives because as much as students need you, your family needs you. If you have children, yeah. they need you. Your grandchildren, if you have them, they need you. Your, your friends, your neighbors. We can't discount the importance of the individual teacher as a human being. Yeah. But the way we activate that and create that environment is that there has to be a collaborative work environment. And I'll just give you one statistic I think you'll find interesting. One of the ways we burn teachers out, and we keep talking about wellness, but we refuse to change, is the amount of direct instruction teachers have with kids. In the highest performing schools and systems in the world, they spend about half as much time in front of students as we do. They spend as much time on lesson design, collaboration, professional development. They believe that if the teacher is better equipped with less time in front of kids, that quality is more important than quantity. In the U.S., the idea is that quantity is more important than quality. So we have kids go to school longer than most nations make them go to school. They're in front of teachers for longer. We even make them go to summer school. We believe that more bad instruction is more important than less quality instruction. Mm. And it's a recipe for disaster. And we're seeing teachers leave our yeah. profession in record numbers. We have fewer young people getting certified in education. That whole work-life balance thing became very apparent to a lot of people during COVID. And the great resignation didn't skip education. Yeah. Wow. That's that's powerful stuff. I think I think a perfect segue before we wrap up is this. Could you give us a brief discussion about your model PLC schools? Because I want to I want to finish this conversation on a on a high mm -hmm. note. Um <clears throat> Uh, so we can both briefly discuss and then, again, uh, we can tell uh, those listening where to go, whether you're a parent and educa educator and, and leadership to go and just see what can change and then start having those and, and find your way as whatever way you as the listener is, is you know, it's going to be most actionable for you to start having this conversation and making a change and hopefully, ultimately reaching out uh, to Dr. Muhammad. Okay. Uh, hopefully for some direction and some assistance in, in making the changes that need to be changed. Because there's, there's literally no sense in gaining information about what the problems are and how they can change in our educational system if we don't take the step of actually putting into it into action. So please, uh, doctor, if you could explain briefly, you know, summarize what your model PLC schools are mm -hmm. um, and, and, and how they can hopefully inspire and motivate some people into action. Okay. Well, so some logistics for those listening, the term PLC means professional learning community. And the model is called professional learning communities at work model. The best way to get a concrete understanding of that model is through a book called Learning by Doing. It's a handbook for the implementation of this philosophy, which is a, a very profound shift from traditional schooling to a collaborative model focused on student learning. In that book, we identify the six key characteristics of a school that is of this model. Well, model PLC schools are schools who produce evidence of proficiency and impact in these six areas. On the All Things PLC website, there's actually even an application that you can download, which tells you or guides you what kind of evidence it has to be produced. Is there a is there evidence? of a collective commitment to working together and focusing on student learning. Our teachers, number two, our teachers given time to collaborate and focusing on student learning and placed into high performing teams. Number three, do those teams identify specifically what we call a guaranteed and viable curriculum, course by course, unit by unit. So if there are three high school algebra teachers are the objectives of proficiency in algebra the same across all three classes? So no matter what teacher I'm assigned to, 
the criterion of excellence has been identified across all the algebra courses. Number four, do those teams frequently gather evidence on my progress towards those objectives in a formative way to inform the teacher and to inform me of my progress against those objectives? Number five, from that evidence, has the school produced a system of support that targets my needs based upon that evidence and gives me enough support and it's consistent and intense until I meet that threshold of excellence. And number six, is it a data-driven, self-reflected reflective environment that we use that evidence of student progress to affect our individual and our collective practice? To be a model PLC school, you have to produce tangible evidence that these six characteristics are prevalent and universally embraced within your, your school. If you do that, and you produce at least three years of growth in indicators of student achievement, you receive the designation as a model of this concept. Of the nearly 500 schools on the website, if you click it under evidence of effectiveness, it identifies where the school is, its makeup, and it has a link to its website and to its principal that you can reach out and ask, can we come visit? Could you share with us your schedule? As being a part of this process, a model school has to agree to be an ambassador to other schools who are seeking to do the same, creating a network nationally and internationally. Beautiful. And, and, and to that point, uh, as we mentioned at all things plc.info, if you go there, there's actually a map uh, of the uh, United States where you can see where those lists of schools are in each state. Uh, not to be biased towards Florida, but Florida's got 13. <laughs> you can hop in wherever you're listening from. Again, that's all things with an S, plc.info. Again, we'll link it to the website at aaronkeithhawkins.com uh, so you can hop on over and take a look. Um, Dr. Anthony Muhammad, I, I, I wish we had about three or four more hours of time <laughs> because uh, I love having these conversations with uh, people such as yourself that are just examples of what leadership is. And, and I say that um, not by about being in a position of leadership, but being someone who has you know clarity in who they are, clarity in what they're looking to do and having those commitments to excellence and making an impact. Um, cause I mean, that's, that's the whole premise of the show. That's what leadership is. And regardless of what your position is, uh, I appreciate you for the impact that you're having. Uh, I, I, you know, not to be a cliche, but, uh, obviously our young people are the future mm -hmm. of this nation and this world. And there is no, there is no higher calling than to be an ambassador, uh, for our young people absolutely, and doing everything we can to lift them up and put them in positions to succeed, no matter who they are, where they're from, uh, what their personal situations may be. So I thank you for your work. Thank you. I hope everyone, as you're listening right now, uh, please take the time to reach out to Dr. Anthony Muhammad and, and just send him a thank you for the work he's doing. Um, uh, I will put make sure I put links to the books that he's written and the work that he's doing and certainly examples of success uh, in some school systems nationwide uh, so that hopefully as you're listening, you can begin to have these conversations in your own districts and make the change that you're looking to make uh, in your in your own geographic areas and for your own children. Dr. Muhammad, thank you so much for your time. You, I, I definitely appreciate you. I'm grateful for this connection, this relationship, my friend. Thank you. Uh, we will talk you to, to you keep, soon. Keep it using the platform for good. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. That's a promise. Thank you so much, sir. If you enjoyed that episode, I'm going to ask you to be a little bit selfish and go ahead and hit that subscribe button to make sure every episode gets delivered directly to you. And second, if you haven't yet, head over to AaronKeithHawkins.com forward slash trust to grab a free copy of my latest book, The Art of Trust and Influence. I think you'd be glad you did. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much for joining us.